Welcome everybody to the session of today's ESHG Virtual Conference 2020. It's a great honor for me to present my work here today on a CRISPR-Cas9 engineered mouse model for GPI anchor deficiency that mirrors the human phenotype and shows hippocampal synaptic dysfunctions. My name is Miguel Rodriguez de los Santos. I'm a PhD student in the Institute for Human Genetics and Medical Genetics of the Charité University Medicine in Berlin. In GPI anchor deficiency, glucosyl phosphatidyl inositol, shortly GPI anchor, plays a crucial role in GPI anchor deficiency. The GPI anchor itself consists of different subunits, mostly of them are SHIDA units, that attach GPI anchored proteins on the cell surface and more specifically on the cell membrane. Um, there are a lot of genes involved in the GPI anchor synthesis and maturation, and it's therefore a quite complex pathway. Among these genes, we have PIGV that encodes for a manosyl transferase that is important for the attachment of the second manose to the GPI anchor. Nowadays, we know that GPI anchor proteins are crucial in signal transduction, cell-cell adhesion, and in synapse formation and plasticity. Therefore, hypomorphic mutations in genes as PIGV that are involved in GPI anchor synthesis lead to the disease GPI anchor biosynthesis defect, shortly GPIBD, that leads to deficiency of post-translational modifications of protein, and therefore the linkage of the protein to the GPI anchor is lacking. Here on the slide you can see GPIBD patients that carry hypomorphic mutations in PIGV. Most of the mutations are actually observed in, uh, in the PIGV gene. GPIBD patients are very sociable individuals. Common manifestations are an intellectual disability, they have a psychomotor delay, and they suffer from sleep disturbances. They develop often epileptic seizures. However, the pathophysiology underlying the disease remains unclear. Therefore, the first aim of this project was to uh, generate a mouse model with a patient-specific mutation. And for this purpose, we used the CRISPR-Cas9 technology in order to introduce the most prevalent mutation observed in European patients in mouse embryonic stem cells that we could further on use in modular aggregation to generate the mouse model. We call the mouse model PIGV341E that represents the amino acid change that is caused by the mutation. We characterized um, the mice and its behavior, and we did also a molecular and cellular characterization. We know from GPIBD patients that carry mutation in GPI anchor genes that these are hypomorphic. Therefore, it leads to reduced function of the, of the enzyme, and GPIBD patients show reduced number of GPI-linked proteins on the cell surface. In order to confirm this in the mouse model, we isolated mouse embryonic fibroblasts that we analyzed in flow cytometry. We stained the cells with FLARE. FLARE is a toxin deriving from a bacteria that is able to recognize all GPI-linked proteins. PIGV341E homozygous mouse embryonic fibroblasts that represents the red dots showed a reduced mean fluorescence intensity in FLARE by approximately 35%. The results showed us that we confirmed the GPI anchor defect in the mouse model and that the mutation in, the, in mice is hypomorphic as in humans. I showed you in one of my first slides the common manifestations in GPIBD patients, as for instance sleep disturbances. However, the spectrum of symptoms are also quite heterogeneous. Therefore, we decided to analyze behavior in mice in the mouse model in an undisturbed way through the home cage scan that is able to recognize up to 80 different behaviors. We observed in the home cage scan that mutant mice were sleeping less as compared to wild type. In a further experiment, we analyzed activity levels through the social activity monitor. For this purpose, we put the home cage on a grid box and through a chip in mice, we were able to recognize the location of each mouse when they were group housed in their home cage. In a first experiment, when mice were hold in, uh, in mixed genotypes, means wild type and mutant mice were hold together, there were no significant differences in total distance traveled and no significant differences in mean distance traveled per phase during the dark and light cycle. However, 
when mice were separated by their genotype, that is here called non-mixed, mutant mice showed an increased total distance traveled and an increased mean distance traveled per phase during the dark and light cycle. That means that mutant mice are more active in wild type and they are therefore sleeping less. And this we could already observe in the home cave scan. We know from GPIBD patients that a quite common manifestation is the psychomotor delay. Therefore, we were also interested in testing motor skills in the mouse model, and we did so by performing the rotor rod performance test. So for this test, we used this machine here that you see on the picture. We put mice on a turning rod, and then the machine is able to measure the time when mice fall off the rod. That is also called latency to fall. And as you see here nicely on this graph, mutant pigv 341 e mice that are represented in red again, showed a reduced latency to fall. That means that they have a weaker motor coordination as compared to wild type. We also tested social behavior through the three chamber test, where we observed in mutant mice an enhanced social approach behavior. And this was displayed by spending more time with a stranger mouse that is represented in red than with an empty cage that is represented in blue. And this was in contrast to wild type mice that did not distinguish between the stranger mouse and the empty cage. We also tested cognitive behavior in the mouse model and more specifically we tested spatial learning and memory in the Barnes maze test. And for the Barnes maze test we used this elevated round shaped maze that has at the edges 20 holes and one hole um, represents an exit to a hidden nest that appears here in green. And um, you see nicely in this video here that after three days, wild type mice don't need so long in order to find the exit to the hidden nest. Whereas mutant mice after three days needed definitely longer as compared to wild type mice. So you see they dip their head more often into uh, wrong holes as compared to wild type until they find finally the exit to the hidden nest. And the time they need in order to find the exit is also called latency to escape. And as you see nicely in this graph, during day one to four that represents spatial learning, mutant mice represented here in red again, had an increased latency to escape during day one to three. At day four, they appear to learn where the location of the exit is. At day five, that represents spatial short-term memory. They still remember where the exit to the hidden nest is. At day 12, however, that represents spatial long-term memory. They showed again an increased latency to, to escape. That means, in summary, they have a delay in spatial learning. Um, they show normal short-term memory. However, at day 12, mutant mice um, reveal deficits in spatial long-term memory. So we learned from the Barnes maze test that mutant mice have deficits in spatial learning and memory. Therefore, we had a closer look in the, into the hippocampus, a brain area important for spatial learning and memory, and more specifically at hippocampal synaptic connections. As we know that GPI linked proteins play a crucial role in synapse formation and plasticity. So we know that GPI linked proteins mediate these hormone heterophilic interactions between pre and post synapses. So in a GPI anchor deficiency, it leads to a reduced number of hormone heterophilic interactions between synaptic connections. And this has further on consequences on synaptic transmission. So we performed following electrophysiology recordings. We stimulized the presynapses with an electric stimulus and measured how much of the information arrives at the post synapses. And indeed, we observed in mutant mice, represented here in red, um, a reduced synaptic transmission that was displayed by a lower EPSP amplitude at different electric intensities. In order to understand which cell types within the hippocampus are mostly affected by the GPI anchor defect, we performed single cell RNA sequencing, where we identified within the hippocampus 17 cellular subgroups in both genotypes.
we observed in single cell RNA sequencing in, within the hippocampus the highest number of differentially expressed genes in microglia 3, in neurons subiculum 1, and pyramidal neurons of the C3 region. Remarkably was that ABL1 and HTC were consistently deregulated not only across all cellular subgroups but also within each cellular subgroups within the hippocampus. ABL1 that encodes for non-receptor to racine kinase was deregulated with a decreased expression and HTC that encodes for a histidine decarboxylase and is therefore important for the synthesis of histamine was deregulated with an increased expression. So we observed in single cell RNA sequencing a misexpression of ABL1. Therefore, we proposed the following pathway mechanism in GPI anchor deficiency. We know that ABL1 plays a crucial role in the afrin R signaling pathway. Afrin R is GPI linked that you see here in blue, activates afrin R receptors at synaptic connections through phosphorylation that activates ABL1 through phosphorylation that has further on consequences on cytoskeleton rearrangement. So GPI anchor deficiency leads to a reduced number of GPI-linked afrin R on the synapse surface that reduces the activity of afrin R receptors and ABL1. So we think that there is a feedback loop that leads to a downregulation of ABL1 gene that leads to a um, reduced number of ABL1 transcripts that leads to a reduced protein expression of ABL1. This has further on consequences on cytoskeleton rearrangement, synapse structure, and also synaptic transmission. So in summary, we were able to generate a mouse model for GPI anchor deficiency with a patient-specific mutation that mirrors the human phenotype. What has not been observed in humans so far is a reduced hippocampal synaptic transmission that we observed in, uh, in the mouse model. Therefore, we can tell for the very first time that GPIBD is a synaptopathy. Furthermore, in single-cell RNA sequencing, we saw that subiculum neurons, microglia, and pyrimidal neurons of the CA3 region are mostly affected in terms of differentially expressed genes. Furthermore, we saw that ABL1 and HTC could be potential key roles in GPIBD. I want to thank all my colleagues and collaborators that worked on this study. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do so. There you find also the link to the bioarchive article of this study. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask me.